because, you know, uh, and I want to do it in a loving way and an honest way. Um, but how, how do you guys propose that we teach students um, about Thanksgiving? <laughs> You're always quick. <laughs> I thought a lot about all of this stuff, <laughs> and I love talking. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so I don't know. I mean, I, I feel like it's going to be a bigger and heavier load to try to get the school and like the systemic change to be. You know, I think it's going to be Thanksgiving for a long time. Um, but I wanted to bring it back to what I said in the beginning was that the biggest misconception is that. Um, the pilgrims weren't thankful, but and the Wampanoag Nation was taken for granted. And there's this big narrative that you know that's resisting a little bit of this change of the conversation around what Thanksgiving is. And um, there's they're saying it's about being thankful, and it's but you know I'm kind of fixated on this kind of idea of like I think I saw it in a post or a tweet or something along those lines. But it's been a message that comes up every once in a while about. America being like the one place that after the, the day after they're completely thankful of everything they have, they're like wrestling each other to be able to buy what they don't have. And so I think this commercialization of Thanksgiving is really disappointing because it really honestly, like, again, like Thanksgiving and being thankful, that's propaganda in some sense because, you know, look at what the actual truth of what's happening, you know, like all the big um, Walmart, Target, Fred Meyer, they're all opening on Thanksgiving at like 6 p.m. 6 p.m. or something along those lines. People are like pushing their Black Friday sales into Thanksgiving and this is completely distracting from like this whole message that like we can't change it because it's about being thankful and it's about eating. But um, I think one thing, <laughs> one thing I thought of was, um, you know, like they're all, it's about being taken for granted. I think, you know, we, ever. A lot of people, anyways, have this tradition of like, oh, what are you thankful for? Everybody go around the table and talk about that. And I feel like the um, opposite or something. Like, so, like, if thankfulness is going to happen, I feel like there's also in some way this element of, like, something is taken for granted or somebody's being taken, taken for granted or something. And so I thought about this idea of, like, what if we all just, go around the table and talk about this year in 2019, when were we taken for granted? (laughs) And when did we take someone or something for granted? You know, like that's actually, you know, leading up thinking about it, you know, other people don't want to take this out as a holiday because you're around your family and so you're around your family for November, for Thanksgiving and then you're around your family again as the year is like the darkest in Christmas and then right after that you're into the new year and so I feel like it'd be a really good um, exercise in some way, like leading up to the new year. It's like, this year, how was I taken for granted? Because that would be, that would teach you boundaries into the next year. Or how did I take someone else for granted? You know, that would teach you how to like think of yourself internally and how you treat other people, you know, because after that you go into, and then it could even start conversations, you know, like, I feel like I could tell my mom something that she did this year <laughs> that we can adjust next year or something you know like <laughs> it's kind of like resolving conflict in some way and that's kind of an idea I don't know um systemically really or like when it comes to children what can be changed but you know I feel like you guys might have some answers <laughs> I I think our kids are brilliant and they can handle the truth <laughs> we can smartly package curriculum that is age appropriate that tells the truth about what happened you know our kids are so brilliant and I feel you know I hear often that some of the fear that goes into not updating curriculum to talk about the true history of the United States that the history of the United States is one of stolen lands and um enslavement and um, privilege that travels through the generations, that there's a fear of talking about that because if we tell people the truth, it might turn people unpatriotic or, or something like that. You know what I mean? Like people will turn against their country if they understand what has actually happened in this place. And I think, um, I mean, if that's the case, that that's reckoning that should happen because it's the truth, right? Right. You know, if you think about the United States as a person, 
a person who has done some pretty heinous things against other people and has done it in the name of equality and freedom and liberation from oppression, right? Because that's what the pilgrims were, were fleeing was religious oppression. Um, that if this person had really done these heinous things um, and then was teaching the descendants of those people that they actively harmed you know, you'd look at them sideways and you'd be like, man, that's a shady AF person, right? <laughs> I'm really proud of myself for not actually swearing in that moment. <laughs> I had a moment. But, I mean, the, the hypocrisy of the country and the ideals that it upholds, um, yeah, <laughs> my mind just went 50 directions at once. Um, Bottom line, I think teaching the truth is where it's at because then you can activate the good thinking of our children around, okay, so what can we learn from that and what needs to change now? Because if we can plant those seeds now, just imagine where they'll be able to take us. Like you were talking about how our high schoolers now are exposed to a level of truth telling that we weren't. That's one bit of hope that I have is that my children are learning about these things so much sooner than I did and I learned about them even though I was an adult sooner than my own mother did and so living in this age of information and sharing and, and, and conversations like these is something that's really hopeful to me because we're living in a time where our younger people if the school system isn't going to teach them I think we're hitting a point where they're going to start forcing the system to teach them because they're going to be exposed in all of these other places that tell them that these this is not the truth. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to that day. And um, I really only hope that I, I live long enough to see it. Yeah, so, yes, yeah, as you said, I think it's possible to teach the next generation something better. Um, it's going to be complicated, it's going to be difficult, um, it's going to require a lot of nuance. Um, but yeah, F yeah. <laughs> of course it's possible. My, 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 my two month old daughter is here. <laughs> um, so yeah, no, it is possible. Um, I mean, if we can, you know, if, if we as a country can, can develop infrastructure to, to carry out and perpetuate this big elaborate lie for many generations, then F yeah, we can tell the truth in a nuanced, complicated way. Um, and then the other thing that I want to add to everything that's been said, because I agree with everything that's been said already, the, the, the only new thing that I want to add is, is I think we also need to teach adults, not just children. Um, and, and as an immigrant myself, you know, I kind of want to take um, that direction a little bit right now um, in that I think for, for many immigrants in this country, and that includes white folks, by the way, right? So I used to say, as a Filipino immigrant, I used to say that, yeah, you know, Filipinos are the largest immigrant in Alaska, the largest immigrant group in Alaska. And that's the truth, by the way. But then I was like, no, 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 AJ, no, white people are the largest <laughs> So I stand corrected, um, but but I think yeah. I mean, if if we're not indigenous to these lands, I think we we have the responsibility, right, to make sure that we understand you know the true history of of, of the of, of these lands and the true history of this country. And as much as we want to advocate for immigrant rights, right, as well intentioned um, as we may be, um, and even those of us you know who may not be immigrants but would like to be allies. Right, and as well intentioned as they may be, we cannot keep saying things like, you know, this is a land of immigrants. Or we cannot keep saying things that, you know, things like immigrants make this country great. As well intentioned as those slogans may be, those are not true. And worse, right, they continue to, to erase the indigenous peoples of these lands. Um, so, so I think even those tiny little changes um, for many of us, Right? and how we function in our everyday lives 
um, can make huge difference. So, how you want to say that? <laughs> oh, I just wanted to um, add something. You said that having these conversations is difficult, and talking with our kids about the truth is difficult, and even as adults encountering these truths is difficult and, and, and I don't want to take away from that because it's true, it's hard, it's complicated and it's complex and it brings up a lot of feelings but also difficult is to labor under this collective lie mm -hmm. to be an indigenous person or a person of color and to be living with the collateral damage that's associated with the truth not being told that is difficult it's difficult to not understand what has happened to our people. It's difficult to not understand the true history of this place and how it continues to show up. So when we talk about that, you know, I want to give a shout out to my, my sister, Lagunai. We, we get to do work, anti-racism work, where we're really bringing our family all together, people of color and indigenous people, our white family, to say, come be co-conspirators in this work with us because... You know, we have to be able to have these conversations and be honest in saying that, yes, it's difficult and hurtful even and painful to have these conversations, but not having these conversations is only preserving white comfort, right? And the rest of us are experiencing this hurt kind of in an invisibilized way that's not acknowledged or recognized, and I don't think any of us want that. So I just wanted to, to acknowledge that, you know, we're laboring under the difficulty of lies, the collective lie. And the more that we can be speaking together about the truths, the more powerful that we'll be. Okay, I wanna thank my panelist speakers. Thank you guys so much. Um, while you guys were speaking, I was thinking about all of these uh, social media posts about millennials killing this, millennials killing that, and maybe millennials killing the idea of Thanksgiving. <laughs> um, and this year was actually the first year that I thought twice about saying Happy Thanksgiving because of some of the you know, horrendous things that it represents. Um, but I also think that you can practice gratitude and celebrate family and be present with one another um, while also taking time to learn the true history. And so I'm practicing some grace with myself saying, you know, it's okay to say Happy Thanksgiving as long as in the same breath, I'm also helping to do the work here. There you have it, folks, the main live podcast discussion on Truthsgiving. A very special thank you to Marie Ashima, who coordinated the entire event, and another heartfelt thank you to Allison akuchuk Warden. Ayu Kasatak, Dr. Ija Ramos David, and Jackie Iglugo Lambert. I'll also be posting an extended version of this episode to include our colorful Q and A session and a special performance by Akumatu. I'm Alice Kunniklen. Over and out.